Welcome, I'm Mark Schaefer, uh, director of the uh, Carnegie Historical Museum. Today is the 26th of September, 2019, and we are gathered here to remember our fallen departed friend, Gene Ludke, who was, oh my gosh, Louise, how many years was he president? 20? I we'll say 20, 20 plus. Involved with the museum, lots and lots and lots of years. He was involved with the founding of the, of the museum foundation, uh, inveterate uh, collector of Fairfield and area memorabilia, and his collections slowly will trickle into these uh, hallowed walls. And we already have a little memorial display set up with his uh, Victorian, what do you call those, picture nail, decorative, like paperweight doodads. <laughs> anyway, a Dexter dog, a, a Harper brush, a mop tin, and uh, postcards that people can look at. Anyway, Gene had an incredible collection. His years as advertising director with the Fairfield Ledger put him in intimate touch with the day-to-day -day of uh, Fairfield history. He knew so much. And many of you may not know this, but the gobble uh, logo for the gobble clothing, the turkey that said gobble, 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 that was Gene Lukey's design. And Lee Gobble was the first person he ever called on as the uh, uh, advertising director for the ledger. So those are little bits and pieces of how Gene fit into the lifeblood of this community. And his knowledge will be missed so on behalf of Rotary, thank you for everybody for coming, first of all. And Louise, we just want to say God bless you and Jean. Um, one of the things that we will really, really miss Jean for is that every new Rotarian that came in got the induction from Jean. Mm -hmm. And he was just so quiet and unsuspecting, and he would catch people every time, particularly on that birthday question. Um, <laughs> It, he just did it so naturally. Other people have tried to fill in, but they, they just haven't come up to snuff. So hopefully, maybe someday we'll find somebody, but I'm not sure. I don't think anybody will do it as good as Gene ever did. The other thing that I really appreciated about Gene is just his quiet wisdom. You know, he wasn't loud and gregarious, but he was quiet. But he also would give his opinions um, thoughtfully, and with a lot of wisdom. And you know, that came from a lot of experience, I think, and his longevity as a Rotarian. And you could see how much he appreciated the group and the people. And um, we just really thank him for that, and for you, for allowing him to come every Friday. And uh, yeah, we're, gonna, we're just really going to miss him. And um, he just really was a blessing to our club. Thank you. Well, here comes Dave Neff. <laughs> I was asked to speak on behalf of the Templeton Templars. Those of you that don't know what Templeton whiskey is, I'm going to give you a two or three minute background check. Can I taste? <laughs> we will see how many are interested. It only has so many ounces left. Welcome. <laughs> The Fairfield First Friday Art Walk one year decided they were going to have uh, historical films presented and so Templeton did an advertisement when they were first rolling this product out. And fortunately the museum is the one that put in the bid to say yes we'll do this. Well the last ones to leave were Gene Lutke, Mark Schaefer, Dick Reed, John Morrissey and Dave Neff. And we thought we better sample it just to make sure that it was the real, the, the good stuff, as they say on here. Thus was born the Templars, and we've been together for eight years or so. We rotate from house to house, so usually September is hosted on Glasgow Road. October, we'll miss the opportunity to see the deer and the corn in, in the Lutke's backyard. But John hosts and Mark hosts up here anyway, and Dick Reed usually does uh, Christmas. So... John Morrissey hosts at his office. Yes, correct. And so anyway, it's, it's an opportunity to gather, and it's a secret society because we forget what we've talked about when we leave. <laughs> 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 it's 
Templeton was started back before Prohibition, and there was a family recipe in Templeton, Iowa, that they put this together. During Prohibition, of course, they couldn't legally sell it, but we understand that there was a truck that came from Chicago once a week. Uh, a. Capone was the name on it, Al Capone, <laughs> and this was part of his bootleg, and he'd bring it home to Chicago, and uh, they would sell it to all their friends and things, and next week a new truck would come back out. Uh, after Prohibition and after, anyway, it went by the wayside, but a few years back, I'm going to say 10 years ago or so, because the six-year whiskey just started coming out recently, uh, one cousin had the recipe and the other cousin had some cash, and they decided they would put them back in business again, and so now Templeton, the good stuff, is back on the shelves, and like I said, they've just gone to a six-year piece on that. So we're very thankful because we spent a lot of good hours together. We solved a lot of the world's Jefferson uh, County problems. We made a lot of history. And we made what? We made a lot of history. We made a lot of history on there. So at our, at our last uh, gathering at our house, I put together a little piece I'd like to read to you now. This is an ode to Gene. There once was a young man named Gene who found antiques to be his means as a way to preserve history and keep all friends in a mystery. The Carnegie was important to him. It allowed his history to come in to the hallowed building on court as all of us find our time to be short. His vision was clear. We must keep these antiquities near and share them with the families of the county so they can all understand their importance for years. Gene and his family were great to allow his time to allocate the focus of history in a way that is not a mystery. So we take this time to appreciate all the gifts from Gene's estate. Louise. Thank you very much. I think we want to hear from John Morrissey. All right, this, I promise it'll be short. And I want to say, Mark and Gene, for some of you, there, a lot of you aren't anywhere near my age, but Mark and Gene were like Doc Sells and Ben Taylor were a generation ago. <laughs> and only they didn't have the benefit of computers, they didn't have the benefit of much video, but they had card indexing that was going on by the day and this place is a beneficiary of that to the point where we have a better collection not out on display mm -hmm. than anybody could imagine. And so, you know, that's, that's a legacy that's going to go on for years someday. I know it was Gene's hope. I know it's the museum board and the museum foundation. So someday there'll be a big capital drive and this building will all be museum. But beyond that goal, uh, I think the next goal, and I know Gene's the same age uh, that I am, we've talked about succession before and so forth. We got to drum up some people in their 30s and 40s uh, to stay with this idea because the history of the community uh, really is important. We learn a lot from it. We've got a lot of things around here that you go back and you look at how did that get where it is today, and it's an interesting story. But there's a lot more to come, uh, and I, we're looking at uh, joking around with taxidermy birds here that have been here a hundred years. But uh, back at the time they were coming here, somebody was thinking about throwing them away, and we can't have that happen. Uh, at least selectively, we can't have that happen. So uh, we're lucky to have Mark. We're lucky to have Gene and his memories. And uh, I can tell you just a couple other things. I go to Old Thresher's every year. I stop in at the Iris Mall Antique Mall. Uh, probably uh, a dozen different people while I was in there or at Old Thresher's that knew me, knew Gene had passed. They all had good things to say and were going to miss him. So I pass that on to Louise, and we talked about that at Templar's the other night. Uh, one of the other things uh, about Gene and Mark and Dave joke about things that go on at Templars, but we solve a community problem every meeting, <laughs> don't we guys? It's just we can't remember how we solve it. <laughs> so, 
Uh, but we're going to keep on doing that. And, uh, anyway, we miss Gene. Okay. So, if anybody has a particular memory they'd like to share, uh, they're welcome to come up and do so. Louise is Louise is <laughs> Louise has graciously declined ahead of time. So. Yeah, we don't want to put her on the spot. Um, and I don't know if they're within earshot or not, but we, we now have a staff of three. I've backed off 20 hours a month, and Therese Comiskey and Stan Plum, recently retired archaeologists from Arizona, and Therese, 30-some years as naturalist at the uh, county park, they are, Stan is our new curator, and Therese is our Oh my gosh, program director, naturalist. But sh she's got things going with the, with, the, with the birds. We have the birding diaries that the Ross, the Ross couple kept back 100 years ago. Uh, the Rosses gave lamps and woods to the county or the state or whoever they gave it to. And they, look, they watched birds for years and years and years. And Therese has gotten Diane Porter and her husband to scan those diaries and uh, do some work with that to kind of buck up our bird displays. Stan is doing great work on furthering Rory Goff's uh, research on the Underground Railroad, which was very active in Fairfield. We were just blown away by all that. So there are so many threads of uh, historical minutia up here. You just can't, you can't believe it. it makes your head spin. A book's coming out next, early next year about the life of Charles Parsons, who was the co-founder of Parsons College with his brother, General Lewis Parsons. And it turns out that Charles' art collection was the nucleus of the first fine art museum west of the Mississippi. We have things he collected in Japan that predate that museum by 20 or 30 years. So we just keep discovering stuff that uh, makes us scratch our heads and wonder how the heck we're gonna get it all done. But, um, Everybody I've mentioned is younger than I am, so we've got a we've got a good start. Jim, did you want to say something? Oh, that's great. Jim Rubis. One of the things that um, one of the skills that Gene had that he was most proud of, but probably not too many neat people knew about it, was that he was an excellent diviner. And I think it started. Uh, when he and a, another Fairfield guy started digging toilet pits. Uh, and maybe some of the things that came to the museum were from some of those toilet pits that they dug up because there were a number of Fairfield bottlers through the years and, and Gene found those. Uh, but where the divining came in was they would uh, find lots where there were houses that went back to the 1800s, uh, pre-Fairfield sewer system. And when they went to those yards, Gene would take the divining rods out and find where the pit was. And he got to be very good at it so that when he and Steve, right, right Louise, Steve Burgraff? Mike. Mike Burgraff. Uh, when they started digging, they knew it was it, and they'd just go down the number of feet they had to and, and find the bottles. Gene expanded a little bit, and I think he claimed that he could also find the location of graves in cemeteries for setting missing stones and that sort of thing. I can't remember for sure if he claimed this or he said other people did and he couldn't, but some of those diviners say that when they go to a cemetery with their divining rods, and they find a grave, they can tell from the action of the divining rods whether the uh, deceased is a male or a female. Gene could do it. Gene could do it, okay. So uh, he, he was great at that, and you know, it's just one of those things that some people don't believe it, but I saw it in action, and it works. Uh -huh. <laughs>